There are very few parasites that are known to infect the urinary tract, just a handful. So one, of course, as you mentioned, is schistosoma hematobium. who's a recurrent UTI specialist and urinary microbiome researcher, but you also have a various other areas of expertise. Um, thanks so much for joining us for this interview today. Yeah, my pleasure. So I, I had the privilege of having trained as not just a urologist and uh, fellowship trained in pediatric urology, even though I, I see adult patients as well, especially those of recurrent UTIs. I also have a PhD in immunology and have tried to integrate those backgrounds uh, to assist in the care of patients with recurrent UTIs. Uh, because of my background, I've also focused in part my research on urogenital schistosomiasis, which is a parasitic worm infection that affects the urinary tract. Mm -hmm. We definitely got a bunch of questions about that. Um, which we can get to a little bit later. I thought, given we are going to be talking about some of the less common causes of urinary symptoms, maybe first we could talk about some of the more common causes that are not your typical UTI. Can you list some of those for us? Uh, of course. So uh, overactive bladder, uh, as well as um, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, in particular of, of the bladder, uh, are some common causes, benign prostatic enlargement in the case of men, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, bladder stones, of course, can also cause urinary symptoms. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came up quite a few times in the questions you received was lichen sclerosis. Can you explain what that is and what the symptoms of this are? So lichen sclerosis, as it pertains to uh, urinary symptoms is um, atrophy, so um, sort of regression of, of normal maintenance of development of the vaginal lining, and it's often associated with menopause. So lichen sclerosis is interesting because not only is it associated with atrophy, it's also associated with chronic inflammation. So clearly, uh, the body's homeostasis in that part of the um, of the urinary tract has gone awry. And it's thought that uh, patients of lichen sclerosis often have improvement with uh, topical estrogen cream, for instance, because the estrogen helps restore on a more normal uh, lining of the vagina that's lost uh, frequently in menopause. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that it happens often after menopause and in patients with chronic inflammation. Are there other patient populations that it's more common in? Um, not so much. Uh, you know, it, it again is, is really a reflection of lower estrogen, at least in postmenopausal patients. And the estrogen has multiple effects on the vaginal lining as well as the lower urinary tract. So first of all, it promotes uh, growth of lactic acid bacteria, so-called good bacteria that most of the time help prevent overgrowth of potential UTI causing organisms uh, that could infect the urinary tract. Estrogen also um, restores more normal lubrication of the vagina. Um, Without that lubrication, uh, many patients have significant discomfort in the vaginal region. Uh, and then more interesting data has indicated that estrogen affects the local immune system in the lower urinary tract. Um, and that loss of this estrogen can uh, result in relative immunosuppression and perhaps increased susceptibility to UTIs. Speaking of the immune system, someone asked if lichen sclerosis is an autoimmune issue, or is it just related in the way that you just mentioned? It's not a traditional um, autoimmune disease where you have a, an antigen 
an antigen is a protein recognized by the immune system. So you don't have an autoantigen, an antigen from the body that seems to be triggering the inflammation. Okay. Um, what type of specialist should someone see for this type of diagnosis? Is a urologist the right person? Mm -hmm. I would say on average, uh, gynecologists see more lichen sclerosis of the vagina. Mm -hmm. um, certainly urologists that see many patients with recurrent UTIs or do female um, reconstructive urology, for instance, are probably more likely to be familiar with these issues as well as urogynecologists. Okay, and is it something that you can actually see on a physical examination or do you have to test for it? Yes. Well, you, you usually can see it on physical exam, but of course, if a biopsy was done, which is usually not necessary, it's also readily identifiable. Okay. Is it possible to actually cure this condition or is long-term management really what you're aiming for? Um, you know, lichen sclerosis can often be uh, reversed at least while on uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, lichen sclerosis is often also treated with uh, steroid creams. Mm -hmm. um, besides estrogen therapy, if, if it's a postmenopausal issue. Okay. So how is it specifically related to UTI symptoms? Can it actually directly cause an infection, or is it more that the symptoms might be mistaken for a UTI? Well, for sure, many of the symptoms associated with lichen sclerosis can mimic mm -hmm. uh, urinary tract infections. And it, in fact, there, there is a term um, uh, which refers to um, symptoms associated with uh, menopause. Uh, the genitourinary uh, syndrome of menopause is an umbrella term that can refer to symptoms such as urinary urgency and frequency that in some cases are due to uh, postmenopausal changes in the vagina and urethra, such as lichen sclerosis, but not limited to just that. Mm -hmm. Are there skin conditions of the genitals that could also mimic UTI symptoms? Um, well, you know, many patients have uh, vestibulo vulvodynia mm -hmm. um, that can also contribute to urinary symptoms. Many of those patients, of course, have classic symptoms of pain with intercourse or pain with what seems like very minimal um, touching, for example, of the external genitals. Is that kind of an, a diagnosis of exclusion type syndrome, or is it something that you can actually identify with a test and then treat? Well, it's very, um, it's very dependent on history and physical exam. Mm -hmm. uh, again, pain with intercourse, if on exam, with very light touch, the patient expresses pain upon contact with the vulva uh, or the vestibule of the vagina. Those are all very suggestive of that diagnosis. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to parasites because I know this is one of your specialties. And you mentioned schistosoma. Are there other parasites that can exist in the bladder or are known or documented to be in the bladder? Um, there are very few parasites that are known to infect the urinary tract, just a handful. So one, of course, as you mentioned, is schistosoma hematobium, mm -hmm. um, which is the cause of urogenital schistosomiasis. It is true that occasionally you will see patients with um, amoeba infections of the urinary tract, amoebiasis, mm -hmm. um, echinococcus, uh, which is a sheep transmitted parasitic infection sometimes affects the kidneys and you can see uh, parasite life stages in the urine. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the whole, it's exceedingly rare to see parasites in the urinary tract itself. Is that the same for the vagina or are there other things that could reside there? So interestingly, uh, S. hematobium, the cause of urogenital schistosomiasis, can cause 
uh, infection of the vagina. And I've seen several cases of uh, patients, female patients, of course, that have visited endemic regions for S. hematobium infection, mm -hmm. unknowingly contracted infection, and then upon return to the U.S., had symptoms of vaginal pain, and they had extensive testing for sexually transmitted diseases, which was negative until finally a biopsy demonstrated parasite eggs in the vagina. Uh, but I would again emphasize that outside of endemic areas, it's a very rare diagnosis. Can you name some of the endemic areas? So S. hematobium is, is endemic in portions of sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Okay. How did you come to do research on this topic? I can't imagine it's very common. Was this something that you came across in your own practice or you just came across research on it? So uh, the reason that I uh, became interested in urogenital schistosomiasis uh, actually dates all the way back to graduate school. So mm -hmm. one of my classmates and good friends is an immunoparasitologist. And for many years, while we were both in training, we discussed how there were not good models of urogenital schistosomiasis, and that that may have been a major reason why research um, lagged in that field. So when I completed my training in immunology and urology, I decided to embark on developing uh, models of this infection, which were quite successful and um, it's been really a nice melding of my interests in the immunology of the urinary tract and infection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what are the symptoms of bladder schistosomiasis? Is, is it similar to UTI symptoms or is there something else that you would look for? So a, a classic sign of urogenital schistosomiasis is hematuria, also known as mm -hmm. bloody urine. Of course, you know, patients with bacterial UTIs can also have blood in their urine. Mm -hmm. That's not uncommon. Uh, other urinary symptoms can include frequency and urgency. Again, that is similar to what many patients with bacterial mm -hmm. UTIs will have. Okay. And do you know how the parasites get to the bladder in the first place? Are they coming from the digestive tract or could they enter the urethra directly from a water source, for instance? So this parasite is very interesting. Um, it's transmitted by a snail. And what happens is the larvae emerge from the snail in water. Mm -hmm. And the larvae actually can sense um, human skin products dissolved in the water. So they follow that gradient to find humans and they burrow th through the skin directly. Mm -hmm to cause infection. And once the larvae are in the body, they develop into worms. And the worms can live for years, individual worm pairs, mm -hmm. and they'll lay thousands of eggs a day, often in the bladder. Oh, that's really horrible to think about. Is the treatment for bladder schistosomiasis the same as it would be if it was elsewhere in the body? Um, so the mainstay of treatment for your general schistosomiasis is an antiparasitic medication called mm -hmm. prosequantil. Mm -hmm. There are a few other drugs that um, don't work as well, but really the only WHO approved drug is prosequantil. Uh, and it's used regardless of any ectopic unusual sites of infection. Okay. And is it 100% effective or is there often a case of a relapse? The biggest issue is that patients can get reinfected even after appropriate uh, treatment with prosequantil. But even in those that are not reinfected, there is some evidence that a single dose of prosequantil probably does not kill all worms. Mm -hmm. um, conversely, there is an, an opinion that uh, eliminating the vast majority of worms may be good enough in suppressing any urinary pathology. Okay. Is there anywhere in the USA that this parasite is found? No. The, the only site outside of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East that this parasite is found is the island of Corsica, oh, really? which is Europe. And mm -hmm. um, that foci of focus of infection was actually the uh, first uh, site of European 
uh, infestation for over a century. Interesting. So if you are in an area where this parasite is known to be, should you preemptively take treatment? So it's not uncommon for uh, visitors to endemic regions such as um, Peace Corps volunteers returning to the United States to uh, be tested and often treated for uh, common uh, parasites such as S. hematobium. Mm 